Hello and welcome to Deep Dive with me, Mitali Mukherjee. Nain Tara Sehgal is one of India's most iconic writers, known both for the range and depth of her writing as she is for her strong political views. In her most recent book that's called Encounters with Kiran, the political, the personal and the writer all come together to create this interesting blend for the reader of a rich and very, very warm and sensitive relationship between two writers. Basically, the book is about Nayantara and renowned novelist Kiran Nagarkar. It's split into two parts, an exchange of emails between them over the years and then, and then many writings by both Nayantara and Kiran. Of course, Kiran Nagarkar passed away in 2019. Joining me now is the author herself, Nayantara, to talk about the book and more importantly, to talk about the overarching political environment that writers, thinkers and civil society continue to live in. Thank you very much for joining in and speaking with me, Ms. Segal, and uh, congratulations on another book from you. I wanted to talk at the very start a little bit about the process. Did you see the book in the form and shape that it took or did you work through the material and did it sort of fall in place organically with the first half being the exchanges between you and Karan and the second being uh, with you and Kiran, I beg your pardon, and the second being a collection of articles and uh, other pieces. I didn't think of anything of the sort, Mitali. <clears throat> I just had the, uh, the emails in mind. Then my publisher asked me to write an introduction to Kiran's work generally, which I added. And then my other publisher, Renuka, decided to make a, a book of Kiran separately, this book, and not as part of a whole nonfiction collection, which is soon going to appear. So I had thought of nothing. Uh, Renuka Chatterjee, my editor at Speaking Tiger, she decided to arrange it in the way that you see it, yeah. which is with the introduction to Kiran's work. I think it's followed by the emails yeah. and uh, then come his articles and my articles. Yeah about the political situation. Indeed. I it was not my arrangement. But it flows very beautifully. Uh, you know, I read a, a review about the book where the writer wrote, this is a personal exchange between two of the angriest, coolest writers of these times. Is that how you, uh, you know, saw your relationship uh, as, as it sort of, as it grew between you and Kiran, the two angriest and yet coolest writers? Do, do you think that, you know, that might be a good way to describe the relationship? Well, it's uh, partly a way to describe it, but the relationship was something much more personal. Uh, we... You know, we didn't know each other. Uh, we met when he apparently had read a book of mine. I think it was Rich Like Us, uh, which won the Sahitya Academy Award. And that kind of got him reading more of my books and ordering copies of them from our joint publisher, HarperCollins. And in my case, I had read Kakold uh, at a festival um, where we briefly met. We didn't know each other. We just briefly met. And I wrote to him afterwards saying that I had met, uh, had written, uh, read Kakold. After that, he had ordered a number of my books from HarperCollins and written to me saying that uh, the Chandigarh Lit Fest should have an interview with me for their archives. So we actually met on the 14th of uh, 
what month was it? <laughs> I forget. But it was long after we had been in touch uh, about books. And that interview is what got us started on writing emails to each other. Keeping in touch. Yes, yes. Um, I was struck by a line very early in your introduction, Ms. Segal, where you write about yourself and you write, being born political myself. I think it's, it's such a beautiful way of describing, um, you know, the generations that you have been part of, your political lineage. Do you think it has shaped a large part of who you are and how you think at this point, this term being born political myself? Um, I didn't hear the last part of the sentence. That the, the term being born political myself, uh, do you think that has shaped a large part of your writing, your personality, the fact that you grew up in the family that you did, the fact that the political influence was that strong through your younger years as well? It, it has shaped my entire life. I think of myself, Mitali, as a writer who was born into and grew up in an occupied country. The whole of India was occupied, obviously. But in my case, it was a very personal situation where all the members of my family had joined Mahatma Gandhi's movement for freedom. Uh, and all of them were constantly going to jail. I say all because I, there were my two parents who each of them had three jail sentences. My father died of his fourth jail sentence. And my uncle Jawaharlal Nehru, who was nearly 10 years in jail at different periods. So this was my upbringing. This was my life. These were the ideals the, of the Nehru Gandhi era, I'd like to call it, in which I grew up, through which I wrote, through which I have become the person that I am. My background was my entire, uh, uh, the whole background of my life. Are you left intrigued by this um, increasing environment then, Ms. Segal, where more and more the hark back or the comparison seems to be um, with Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru? I mean, this is actually uh, on the increase since 2014. Every act of disappointment seems to be threaded back mm -hmm. to the Nehru era. Are you, are you able to hear me, ma'am? Would you like me to repeat the question? Yeah, please. Yes. Are you intrigued by this increasing fascination with comparing every event with uh, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, Ms. Segal? Because increasingly, and, and it seems to have increased in the last two years, where every act of failure or disappointment is quickly pulled back to the Nehru era and said, well, you, you know, that's where the problem started. You know, uh, this is not a question of going back to the Nehru era for one reason or another. My India and the, the India of millions of other Indians is disappearing in the year 2014, when the uh, BJP was elected to power, it immediately began to unravel India and to make something else out of it, which today is unrecognizable as India. This is not India. This is a foreign country. To me and to millions like me, this is a foreign country of hatred, exclusion, and a complete destruction of the great civilization that has made us what we are. I'd like to quote to you what Gabriel Garcia Marquez once said about his country. He wrote or said somewhere, 
my country is home to the human race. This is what India was, home to all the great cultures of civilization. Today, what is it? It is a shrinking, shriveled dot on the map of hatred for everything that is not Hindutva. This is not my India. It is not the India of millions of us. Thousands of us are in jail. Thousands are without jobs. I have in my memory a, a horrible, truly painful situation of those many thousands of Indians who were marching back home because they were left jobless at the time when COVID began. One can't get those pictures out of one's mind. That's what I've been writing about. We are in a period of hatred and violence. Today, an open call for violence, by today I mean in the last few days or weeks, an open call for violence has been made by the powers that be. Go out and kill outsiders. Now, uh, the latest phase of that policy is to attack Christians. My Christian friends are living in fear today as my Muslim friends are living in fear. This is not my India. And it was not Kiran's India. No, indeed. And in one of your email interactions, Kiran writes to you saying, I have never felt so terribly alone. Um, is that I wrote that. Sorry, I wrote that, that to yes, Kiran. you wrote that to him. Has that increased for you, Ms. Segal? Um, do you feel increasingly despondent about the situation or, or, or do you feel that there is a turn coming at this point? I didn't feel despondent, Mitali. I felt despairing, utterly despairing. So did Kiran. And we had that bond of the, of the entire political situation being what it was. The last uh, horrible thing which happened while he was still alive was the army's occupation of Kashmir. People like us don't settle for this. We do not sit back and say, okay, I must keep my mouth shut because there will be consequences if I don't. Neither he nor I were that kind of person. And when I read him after Kakold, when I read all his other books, starting with Ravan and Edi, the whole trilogy, I immediately understood because I have read a lot of books and in a long life I have met every kind of person you can imagine. I knew, I, I immediately understood that he was a man of supreme integrity and that is why when he said he wanted to come and interview me for an interview that would be archived uh, in Chandigarh. I agreed. Normally, I don't, would never allow somebody I didn't know to just walk in and interview me. I have always preferred to stay in the background and let my books speak for me. But I said, yes, please do come. And that was what started a very, um, how shall I say, rewarding relationship for both of us. I wanted to ask what you think feeds this um, th this complacence amongst the majority at this point. There doesn't seem to be as much criticism uh, as there should be of things that are apparently wrong. I mean, as Kiran himself wrote, democracy is not a gift. It needs to be earned. But when you look, Ms. Segal, at the larger majority, it seems that there is a sense of sitting back and accepting the situation as is. 
Yes, and that was one thing which absolutely enraged Kiran, this apathy. He felt that there could be nothing worse than people sitting back in apathy when such things were happening. But I think there are other reasons for it. One is that maybe most or nearly most of the voters in the, in the 2014 election were young. They had no experience of the past India. And uh, they were people concentrating more on subjects uh, that related to um, not to the social sciences, not to history, literature, subjects like that, not to the humanities. They were, in that sense, uneducated uh, in that side of, of India. And uh, a third factor was that, unfortunately, this feeling about not so less about the Christians, though now it has become very strong, uh, but against the Muslims, that they came here as invaders and can never be thought about as anything else. And I think a great many Indians, that is their psyche. That's what they believe. I want to talk about a few other pillars of democracy, Ms. Segal. Um, in your book as well, you've mentioned some interactions on TV debates where Kiran felt he wasn't given the space to speak. You yourself were a reporter with the Indian Express during the emergency and you spoke out against Indira Gandhi. Are you dismayed by what you see at this point across most of uh, mainstream media and the complete lack of either question or often even ethics in reporting? I was never a reporter. I was an individual who was fairly regularly contributing articles on the political situation to the Indian Express and became associated with them and got friendly with Mr. Goenka, who was a great help to me when I, uh, when JP asked me to join him in Bihar, and it was Mr. Goenka who provided the car to take me around Bihar and that kind of thing. So, uh, and I never could have become a reporter because Indira Gandhi would not have accorded me the facility uh, of being a, a, a practicing journalist. I never became that. I was on my own. I think I've been alone all my life making <laughs> the decisions that I have. And it is my background, which has been my huge strength in doing so. <clears throat> so uh, between the emergency and now, we have a huge um, connection or comparison. Both are both are dictatorships. In Mrs. Gandhi's case, it was very clearly and openly a dictatorship where you did not even have the right to life and liberty. In today's case, there's a very important, uh, how shall I say, attempt on the part of our rulers to keep calling themselves a democracy. When we know very well they are not, there are thousands of people in jail without trial. Artists are being, what shall I say, even killed. Priests have been killed, Father Stan Swami. This kind of thing is going on. It doesn't happen in a democracy. You don't get a man arriving on a motorbike and shooting a man who opens the door to you, which has happened with the three rationalists who were killed by passing motorists. Would you call this a democracy, Mitali? I don't. 
the other pillar that seems to have um, that seems to be facing pressure, Ms. Segal, is the point of criticism that while the the party in power is doing one thing, there is not a strong enough opposition that is creating an opposing force or opposing these decisions or providing alternatives. Do you agree with that criticism at a central level? And do you think um, India's largest and oldest party needs to do some soul searching in that regard? No, it has to do a lot of soul searching. There's no question about it. So do the other parties, which are cutting each other out. It's a great tragedy that the political opposition is not getting together. But we have the example before us of a huge, the biggest opposition the world has ever seen in the farmers' revolt, which won. Which won. It was a huge victory for the farmers and for all Indians who believe in freedom and who were backing them. Uh, we were all amazed looking at what the Sikhs were doing for the farmers, for instance, stepping forward and providing them with food and everything they needed. So there were these revolts, not only the farmers was the biggest and the most impressive, but students were revolting. Look at Kanahiya Kumar, teachers, academics, lawyers, judges, even some judges. There were revolts going on at every level. And the vice president had occasion to speak about this on one occasion, not the present vice president. Today's government appointees are chamchas. I always think that's such a good expression, Mitali. Why? Because you can do what you like with a chamcha. You can eat your soup with it. You can scratch your back with it. You can get do everything you want. It is at your bidding. You mentioned earlier that... A As for the media... Yes, please. No, no. I was please. only going to... Uh, I think you mentioned the media. And uh, I, I just want to say that this is what happened in Mrs. Gandhi's time. They were asked to bend and they crawled. And uh, the media today, one by one, it has backed out of saying, uh, uh, giving us news. What are we hearing? Is this news? Much of it is fake news. Much of it is lies. That's not news. And the ones which have been resisting, uh, I think, are being gradually bought over. This is not a government from which we're getting news. We can't rely on it anymore. I think that this government secretly greatly admires Mrs. Gandhi and is following in her footsteps. <laughs> I have heard say of that. Uh, <laughs> you know, you mentioned earlier that so many of your decisions were taken alone. And I think you displayed great bravery in each one of those as when you returned the Sahitya Academy Award. and. Um, an international observer made the point that women artists often play a significant role in calling out fundamentalism and extremism. At this point, we have faces like Sudha Bhadwaj, like Natasha Narwal, like women from the Muslim community who are fighting against online abuse. Uh, do you believe that might be the crucible from where really strong opposition is built? The women will speak out. The women have always spoken out and the feminist movement is a very old movement and feminists have always spoken out against abuses and any injustices that women have suffered. Many, I should say, not any. That's always been the case. But yes, uh, today there is uh, uh, what has been called the Me Too movement where women have been talking about their abuses, particularly in America, 
and Harvey Weinstein and all the rest of it. Uh, and it has gathered uh, speed and I think it has had to be. Uh, obviously, women must speak out. People like Sudha Bharatwaj, I admire greatly and have spoken about her myself. There are all those, but in my view, uh, and I've discussed this considerably at, uh, in the book yes. uh, I wrote about Kiran, yes. is that I, I felt the Me Too movement, which is going very strong, had taken a wrong direction because, number one, it never spoke for the, the majority of Indian women whose workplace is home. And it is there that they can be raped or abused or uh, disused in any way possible, uh, even by their husbands or other relatives. Uh, I don't think enough was said about that or anything was said about that. And it, I was particularly, how shall I say, enraged by the behavior of the then Chief Justice of India, who his staff member, a young woman on his staff, complained of being abused by him. Now, this was a woman standing alone. She had neither money nor influence, and she had nobody behind her helping her or telling her what to do. She had the courage to speak out. You know what she was made to do? I've written this also in the book. The wife of this judge, made her matha teko, bend down and touch her feet and apologize for making such an accusation against her husband. This woman was turned out of her job and not she alone, her whole family suffered for a long time. In the end, it was put right. And the most extraordinary thing about the ending was that this the judge who had uh, made the abuses put himself on the panel to judge himself. So, <laughs> you know, it was a joke. Yes. It but it was the courage of that woman which made me write that here is a woman who was alone why didn't you, anybody important among you, say a word to defend her? Nothing was said. In your, uh, in the part where you address the Me Too allegations against Kiran, Ms. Hegel, you talk a lot about your views on the subject as you just outlined, but there isn't that much of what Kiran was experiencing or feeling at that time, uh, given the nature of your exchange, no, you must have talked the, about it. How was he feeling? Yes, we talked about it and he died of it. Let me tell you that the last year of his life and his wife or his partner, Tulsi Vatsal, told me the same thing, that he was in such a state of deep depression about this. Uh, he once said to me, when they see me coming along the road, they cross the road. And uh, it killed him in the end. He was a very ill man anyway, but it did kill him. I have one final question for you. Um, it is a privilege for journalists like me to get to speak to writers and thinkers like you who have seen so many circles um, in, in the larger concept of time. How do you feel about where we are right now, Ms. Segal? And does, do you feel hope, first of all? And if the answer to that may be yes, 
what gives you hope about the situation that india is in now or where it's reached at at this point of its independent life and whether things can turn it's a long question yes but i think uh, there was a great occasion for hope when uh, the women's movement took place shaheen bag there was great occasion for hope when the farmers won their case aside from that i am in utter despair utter despair and it was kiran who taught me utter despair because i kept saying there's still hope something will happen he said believe me it will not it will not he said i am a damaged man he referred to his continued state of ill health but i know from my own experience that these things don't improve it will get worse and worse it's a long haul and he has been proved right the only hope now is that the coming elections may make a change in uttarakhand and punjab which are the first two uh, assembly elections taking place there'll also be increased covid cases because nobody has has obeyed the rules of uh, no rallies no crowds everybody wearing masks none of that has happened so your guess is as good as mine mitali <laughs> <laughs> those are um those are sad words but they are honest words and i think the the best thing we can do at this point is be honest about what we face um i think your words struck me the most miss segal in one of your speeches in the second half of the book where you write what can writers do in these times they can write and, they can write uh, yes and that's what kiran kiran and i both thought that there's no question of retiring from the situation and sitting back with your mouth shut on no on on no occasion can we do that whenever something happens we must speak and we did loud and clear and we are all the prouder for it and uh, the beneficiaries of your bravery and courage and words thank you so much miss segal for taking time out and speaking with me thank you for writing this beautiful and and deeply emotional piece and um, I, i i hope to see much much more from you and from your mighty pen thank you very much for joining